We continue today with the readings from Unwind Your Mind Back to God by David Hofmeister. We are reading from Book 1, Laying the Foundation, Chapter 1. Today's section 8 is entitled, Apply the Ideas. And since it is a really long section, we are going to do it in two parts. Apply the Ideas, Part 1. David, the truth is within us. Let's come together with the intention of becoming very clear in our discernment between ego and the Holy Spirit. This requires looking closely at the mind and how it works. As we allow the Spirit to come amongst us, questions are asked, answers come, and experiences are shared. We want to take practical examples from our lives and apply the ideas to them. If we do not use the Course, it is just a book filled with high ideas of metaphysics and theory. All spiritual teachings are meant to be applied. We need to live the teachings. If there are parts of our lives that are not congruent with them, then it is helpful for all of us to be aware of those things so the mind can shift and be a demonstration of the truth. As upsets come up in daily life, they can be traced back through the metaphysics, which are meant to be practical and useful. We must always come back to the awareness that it is our own perception that needs to be healed. Our minds make the decision to heal or not. There is never anything happening in the world of form that causes a change in mind. There really is only one question that the mind keeps asking over and over on a very deep level. Who am I? The ego asked the first question ever. There was no question in heaven. There was just oneness. There have been an awful lot of questions raised since this first question of who am I? It was the ego that asked it. Christ did not ask this question. There is complete certainty in heaven. Every other question has come from that first question, including all the questions about the world, about the subatomic levels, about science, about philosophy. All the other questions are just stacks and stacks and layers upon layers of questions on top of that first one. In the deceived state, the mind is still asking that basic question. Who am I? The ego has many answers. You are a man or a woman. You are a son or a father or a brother. You are a sister, a husband or a wife. You are a construction worker, an engineer, a mathematician, a tennis teacher. The ego gives us lots of answers and is constantly in there saying, you are a combination, you are this, this, this and this. Underneath it all, the mind just is not sure because it is still asking that central question, who am I? Identity seems to keep shifting and changing. I was a son. Now I am a father, or now I am a grandfather, or I was a banker, now I am on to this or that. It is very unstable and constantly shifting. We want to keep working it back down deeper and deeper into the mind to get at that central question 
of who am I and to find where the experience of the answer is. Every question asked within this world is a double question. We cannot really come to an understanding of the answer if we cannot even ask the right question. If we are asking questions that are nonsense questions, questions that ask and answer in themselves, they are circular questions that do not go anywhere. All questions asked within this world are but a way of looking, not a question asked. A question asked in hate cannot be answered because it is an answer in itself. A double question asks and answers, both attesting the same thing in different form. The world asks but one question. It is this. Of these illusions, which of them is true? Which one establish peace and offer joy? And which can bring escape from all the pain of which this world is made? Whatever form the question takes, its purpose is the same. It asks but to establish sin is real and answers in the form of preference. Which sin do you prefer? That is the one that you should choose. The others are not true. Text chapter 27, section 4 When we pull this back to our daily lives, we see that the dominant theme of each day comes from the seeming situations that make up the menu of the world, and they are all illusions. We spend a lot of time and frustration debating the seeming options. Do I want to go here to eat dinner or there? Do I want to call this person or not? Do I want to date this person or not? Do I want to buy this kind of car or not? Do I want to invest in this mutual market fund or do I want to invest in CDs? There is a lot of strain and energy put into which illusion is true. Which ones are the best? Underneath that is the mind's belief in an in a hierarchy of illusions. It does not see that these are just projected images. It has the images ranked. These are my top illusions. I spend a lot of effort and energy pursuing them. Then there is the middle level which I am indifferent about. Let people pursue those illusions if they want. I do not really care about them. And then there are the negative ones, the illusions I spend my energy avoiding. I do not want to be around this person. I do not care if they are illusion or not. I don't like them. Or I do not like this kind of weather. If I move to Hawaii, I can get away from this weather. Hawaii has better weather. You can see that there is a hierarchy here. Most questions that are asked both ask and answer. That is where the preference comes in. Each person has this hierarchy. Everybody has their version of the good life, which can be different because everybody has an unconscious sense of the good life. You have to really take a look at these questions that you are asking. What can the body get that you would want the most of all? It is your servant and also your friend. But tell it what you want the most of all. It is your servant and also your friend. But tell it what you want and it will serve you lovingly and well. Text chapter 27, section 4. Jesus is speaking sarcastically here because this is how the ego thinks. And this is not a question for it tells you what you want and where to go for it. It leaves no room 
to question its beliefs, except that what it states takes questions form. Text chapter 27, section 4. In this world, it has been forgotten that we are spirit, that we are mind. In the deceived state, the ego says, God made you a body. Very well. You already know that you have a limit here, so you better make the best of it. You better go for all the gusto you have got. You know you are stuck and you are limited. You have already separated from the kingdom and thrown away your spiritual inheritance. You might as well just go for the gusto. Eat, drink and be merry for you shall die. <laughs> Friend, I have certainly done my share of that. David, and the ego does not tell us with all its aiming for the gusto that the world is the last place we could ever find peace and happiness. The world was made as a smoke screen so we would not go back in our minds in meditation and sink down inside to be with the Holy Spirit where our true happiness and salvation resides. You know that the old Bible says, The kingdom of God is within you. Luke, Book 17, Chapter 21 Oh, I'm sorry, that's Luke, the book of Luke, Chapter 17, Verse 21 The ego says, No, it is without it is that codependent relationship. Go for the relationship. Go for the possessions. Go for the fame. Go for the glory. Go for something out there. We have had a lot of examples of people who have followed it all the way out. I think of extreme examples like Marilyn Monroe. She had all the money, all the fame, all the sex appeal. She was married to Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller. All these variations of the ego's premise of seek and do not find. Text chapter 12, section 5. The course gives us the framework to see this. It is very different than the biblical seek and ye shall, ye shall find. Book of Luke. Chapter 11, verse 9. The world keeps putting the carrot out front. Fame, fortune, money, good looks. We keep looking for these satisfactions in form and we keep asking these pseudo-questions. And Jesus says, A pseudo-question has no answer. It dictates the answer even as it asks. Thus is all questioning within the world a form of propaganda for itself. Text chapter 27, section 4. Later he says, An honest question is a learning tool that asks for something that you do not know. It does not set conditions for response, but merely asks what the response should be. But no one in a conflict state is free to ask this question, for he does not want an honest answer where the conflict ends. Text chapter 27, para 4. This is about the very instant that this powerful, powerful mind seemed to buy into this tiny, mad, ridiculous belief in separation. Giving such a powerful mind as that of the Holy Son of God to the ridiculous thought that he could separate from his Creator was literally the big bang in the mind. That is where all the guilt arose. The answer to this was not given after, it was given simultaneously. 
The instant the belief seemed to be bought into, the Holy Spirit was given as an answer for it. The good news is that your only problem has been solved. It is already solved. That is good to know because it can seem at times like it is still open to question whether this is solved or not because of the feelings that are experienced. The number one question for the ego mind is, how could this happen in the first place? History would not exist if you did not keep making the same mistake in the present. The present moment is your point of power. That is where you make decisions and that is where you can choose salvation. We conceptualize ourselves as having been on the spiritual journey for a number of years and we are moving back towards awareness of God, towards wholeness and completion. We think of salvation as in the future. Someday, if we really keep at it, salvation will come. Why would God place salvation in the future? Wouldn't the time that you have to suffer through between the present and the future make God cruel? Kind of like the idea that Jesus died for our sins? What kind of father would have his son shed his innocent blood? God did not place salvation in the future. He put it in the present. All of salvation is offered to you this very instant. There is a lot of relief with that. But the ego can jump right in and go. Oh, I should be able to get this now. Please help me get this. I want to now. <laughs> Basically, Jesus has 1,200 pages that say you are terrified of the Holy Spirit. You are terrified of accepting that answer right now. That is why Linear time was born. The past and the future are the mind's attempts to evade and avoid the present. On a conscious level, that can seem like, well, that is kind of funny because I feel like God is my friend and the Holy Spirit is like my partner. And now Jesus is telling me that I am terrified of the Holy Spirit? This makes sense when you see that during the blip, when the tiny mad idea seemed to happen, the mind believed that it actually had usurped heaven, that it had usurped God's place in heaven. And the ego counseled, Run! You have done it now. Run away from that light because if you ever come back, that light is going to get you. Because you have really done it. You have pulled it off. You have separated from your father. And now your father is angry. This whole world has been an attempt to run from the light into the darkness, into the fragmentation, into the duality. No one wants to ask an honest question because he is afraid to hear the answer. What we are learning is that the Holy Spirit is the answer. Into this darkened mind that believes that it separated from God, God placed a spark of light that is the Holy Spirit. That light will grow and grow until it literally illuminates the whole mind. But the mind is very afraid of it. The ego is a belief in the mind that projects out the world. Now, 
Would God have placed the answer where the problem is not? Would God have placed the answer in the world if the problem is in your mind? No. God placed the answer right where the problem was. The answer is in our mind. The Holy Spirit and the problem are in the mind. The belief in separation is in the mind. This world is a smoke screen, a giant distractive device that keeps you from going down into the mind and questioning all the assumptions and beliefs. In the analogy of the World Trade Center, both the Holy Spirit and the ego are in the basement. All the flaws of the World Trade Center are layers of beliefs. The mind is so terrified of the light that it has stacked on all of these layers of dark floors so that it can forget about the light. The deceived mind has literally tried to dissociate and just forget about the light. The mind has disassociated because light and darkness do not go together. They are kind of like oil and water. When one is present, the other is absent. And the mind could not stand this intolerable condition of holding two thought systems that are not reconcilable. The ego thought system and the Holy Spirit's thought system. The ego's answer is to forget about one. Dissociation is to forget about the light. There seems to be a little bit of relief. But really, it is just buried and the mind is still in pain because it is not in its natural state. In heaven, the mind is a state of oneness, completion and wholeness. When the mind, when the split is in the mind, it is very uncomfortable and intolerable. Therefore, the mind projects it out into the world. All of a sudden, the smoke screen becomes a real world of duality. Instead of the duality being these two thought systems in the mind, now it is seen in the world. For example, male-female, hot-cold, fast-slow, tall-short, we could go on all night. The whole world seems to be just extremes of duality. Now the mind seems to get some kind of relief because it believes it is a little teeny figure on the screen. It has forgotten that it is this vast, vast, powerful mind. Now it is this little teeny person and in a sense, it is a little whole person, even though it does not feel very whole sometimes. In a sense, that is the trick. You can see that there is an identity that has been made up. That it is not our true identity. Our true identity is Christ but this little bitty identity has got all this stuff made up in the dream world. I was born in such a such place and these were my parents. I grew up and I have this life history and these were my main life events. My fourth grade teacher embarrassed me and I had my first kiss when I was 13. This is a substitute because the true identity is magnitude. It is vast, powerful spirit. In this world, when we identify with this teeny little person that we think we are, it feels very tiny and very limited. 
Not only that, but it seems like there is this gigantic world around this teeny little person where people seem to be competing against it all the time. Competing for jobs, competing for love, competing for resources. There are hurricanes and tornadoes. There are things it has to constantly defend against and watch out for. When really, it is just a dream. The problem is that it is identified with this little teeny speck of flesh instead of the vast light which is its reality. As you go through life, you seem to be confronted with all of these issues and problems out on the screen. Financial problems, relationship problems, health problems. But you really just have one problem and it is down in the basement. And you have one solution to your problem, thank heaven. It is down in the basement of your mind. We start from where we perceive the problem, up here on the top of the World Trade Center, which is on the screen of the world in this analogy. I have a problem with this person. They bug me. This is what bugs me about them. You start from describing the problem as you perceive it, and then you start tracing it back into the concepts and beliefs that are in the mind. The flaws of the World Trade Center that really are the cause of the problem. All of those dark flaws sprung from the ego. They are all just false beliefs. That is an overview of the metaphysics of the Course. We do not start our discussion with the idea that God is love or I am the Christ because most people do not have that in their experience. We start at the level of perception. Most people perceive themselves as being impinged upon by the world and are struggling to keep their head above water emotionally and financially. When the mind is identified with this little speck on the screen, it seems as if the world has caused it. The mind that believes it is a body believes that its origin is on the screen as well. It thinks that its earthly parents are its origin. The mind that believes it is a body, holds grievances. I did not ask for this. I do not want a life like this. I do not like these things happening to me all the time. I want it to be different than this. The cause of everything is believed to be something on the screen. The economics, the IRS, genetics, the husband, the wife, the heart condition, childhood trauma... Some event out here on the screen is the cause of my life being in shambles. But it is not the memories that are the cause of trauma. It is the interpretation in this very instant. The interpretation that we are giving it in the present is causing the trauma to our mind. And where is this interpretation coming from? The mind is calling the memories forth from the vaults of the past and trying to keep them. It is all over in the holy instant. We are guiltless and innocent right now. But the mind is afraid of that. It keeps calling the past into the present and keeping things complicated because it is too terrified of the holy instant. It is too terrified of the Holy Spirit. 
This insight is a very helpful lens through which to look at our life and all the problems we think we have on the screen. If you try to change the behavior but do not really start opening up and going within, you are not really making a change at all. You will probably have other symptoms that will spring up. You are just shifting the form. Ultimately, it is really time which is at the root of all problems. There are a lot of psychotherapies starting to get into beliefs, but the course points to the awakened mind that has literally transcended the ego entirely. That is what makes it such a clear and powerful tool. That is also why there is such enormous resistance to working with it. The ego is very resistant to it because it is a very sharp tool for cutting away and dissolving the deceptions. And the belief in time and space is at the bottom of it, at the very bottom floor of the World Trade Center. But when people wake up in the morning for their 6.30 a.m. meetings, their mind is usually not at a place where it is questioning linear time or questioning space. Usually it is already off on its plan of action and pursuits. There have been a number of therapies that talk about living in the present moment, but they have not gone quite so deeply into how, how to live in the present and how to undo the belief in time and space. You cannot just talk about this stuff and read about it. You have to live it. My life has been a process of going down and raising this stuff up and coming to the point where I have examined concepts and literally stepped out of them. Then I could say, I am not this, I am not that. You keep going. It is about starting to move towards a point of stepping out just trusting that things will be provided and letting the Spirit come through. If you have issues or things going on in your life, we want to come together. Let the Spirit come amongst us and get some clarity on those things. We have a metaphorical framework to work with. We have a basic agreement on some of the metaphysics and now we want to really put into application. Friend, how do we get into the present? How do we actually apply this so that we are not planning for the future and worrying about the past? David, Remember we said that there was a God substitute made or a substitute self made in place of the Christ? That is, where the, that is what the self-concept is. The self-concept is the purpose of the learning of the world. Everyone comes here without a self and makes one as he goes along. We learn things, whether we think we learn them from our parents or we learn them at school. We learn how to judge. These are the good things in life. These are the things that will make you secure and safe. These are the bad things in life. These are the things you need to avoid. That is all part of the ego system. The judgment that we learn in this world is which things to pursue and which things to avoid. This is part of the defense system against trusting in the holy instant, against trusting that the spirit can do it. In this world, mature judgment means learning the ways of the world very well, 
But true wisdom is the relinquishment of judgment. That can be unsettling. Having come here and learned how to be a good judge of right and wrong, you start to see that your whole system of discernment is still part of the ego system. Any kind of evaluation in a positive or a negative way literally denies that everything is equally illusory. It is like you have constructed a maze from all your judgments. You have a maze of completely going there. You have a maze of complexity going here. And the Holy Spirit is your guide now. He is going to guide you out of the maze. The Holy Spirit is evaluative. In other words, the Holy Spirit does judge, but He is capable of judging truly because He can see the past, the present and the future. Think of when you are trying to judge in the maze. Do you have cognition of the past and the future? Do you know the results of every decision that you make and how it will affect everyone else? It is not that you should not judge, but to see that you cannot. You are not capable of accurately judging. That is why you need the Holy Spirit. In that sense, the Holy Spirit is judgmental. In a maze, you can only go left or right. At every point, we have all these seeming decisions to make and the Holy Spirit is in there guiding us. Go left. Go right. He knows the way out of the maze. Friend, and how about when someone who is evil is affecting you? I'm serious. I went into business with this 24-year-old man who has the ability to make hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. He is in my eyes evil. He has power. I believe that he has power in his voice. He could walk into a room and just by steal you blind and you would not even know it. I got into this business with this guy with all these big expectations and came to find out this guy is the biggest crook I have ever met in my life. What is going on right now? What is going on right now is that he wants to sue me. I feel in my heart I did nothing wrong. He is the one that wronged me. It is crazy. <laughs> David... What I am hearing is that you are feeling the tension. You are feeling the fears, frustrations and anger. You have no idea of the extent of the self-hatred that is in your own mind. We have to unveil the extent of that self-hatred. What happens with this intolerable split in the mind, with this intolerable hatred is that it gets projected. That is the way that the ego deals with it. It wants to project it. That is the whole idea of evil out in the world. What is sometimes called a devil or a force, it seems to be very active, very powerful and very destructive. The devil is the ego. A belief in your own mind. Someone asked Gandhi about the devil once and he said, The only devils in this world are those running around in our own hearts and that is where all our battles should be fought. It sure can seem in this projection like there are evil forces around us, but that thinking is false. The Course is a book that can systematically walk you through the correction. Our brothers are mirrors for us on an unconscious level. Relationships can be used to flush up the unconscious beliefs. People will often say, Wait a minute now, 
I can see mirroring to a certain degree. But I have witnesses and examples that will only go so far. They will say, for example, I know a person who is very sloppy and lazy. And I am not sloppy and lazy. I do not care for what the Course says. <laughs> it is not about the behavioral level. The mirroring goes back to our beliefs. In other words, if we judge somebody as being sloppy or lazy, there is a box that we have, a sloppiness box or a laziness box. And we have a certain group of behaviors that we put together in there and we read it onto the screen. You have to go back into your mind and look at these boxes that you have constructed. And we have lots of boxes. That is what the ego system is. There are judgments, categories and boxes. In business there are a lot of boxes because the ego is so tied into appearances. Ultimately, we need to let go of relying so much on our physical senses and to start to trust this intuitive voice. We are fooled and deceived by what our eyes see and what the ears hear. It is fun to be on a path that is guiding us to think, Oh, thank you. Now I'm going to let go of some of my judgments and start listening and opening to my intuition. That is literally our safety, our joy and our happiness. It is great that you can just be. It seems like it is all coming right up there. You are not stuffing it. You are definitely not stuffing it. It is like a volcano. <laughs> we end this reading of Section 8 right here and we will continue with Part 2 of Section 8 in our next reading. <laughs>